Chapter 8 talks about the structure of organizations. Again, it's working a lot with larger companies. You could be working at the local diner. There probably is no real structure except for the owner who has everybody working for him. But if it's a restaurant chain, there's going to be a hierarchy, especially from corporate to managers to marketing people coming in and having too many bosses. Uh, there's a lot of learning objectives here. They, t they have different people that had these organization management techniques, and some of them are good, some of them are bad. Things have evolved a lot in the past, I would say, 150 years or of the Industrial Revolution. And it talks about people working up there with the management style. Some people have a compassionate style. Some people can be very autocratic. Even if they're autocratic, they can be fair people. And a lot of companies where economy has been going through a lot of upheaval, especially with brick and mortar stores going, uh, a lot of them are closing, losing business. People are shopping online. I would not say it's something that's going completely dead. There are some that are thriving. They are providing services that you're not going to get online. I do not think the um, human college going to classes will go away. I know you are taking an online class, yet you are learning. There's no human interaction. We will probably never meet. Um, but I want you to know that the tactile thing is part of the way to go in many ways. You can't exactly have a happy hour while you're all texting each other, you know, on your bus or sitting at your home or wherever the classroom. And a lot of large companies, even smaller ones, do want to have some organization. You want to keep things flowing here. For example, you just have that restaurant or coffee shop. It might grow. You might own three or four coffee shops. Are you going to have a manager for each shop or a manager for, let's say, every two or three shops? So that way they can manage it. And then you could have a supervisor underneath. It's how you see how things are growing. You're working with realities talks about we are also in a business or I should say world where we are very cost competitive now and um, people want bargains but the other thing too is you got to charge a fair price you've got to um, be manage safety are you going to um, take shortcuts uh, for example, if they're applying lawn chemicals, should they be wearing rubber gloves, wearing masks or something? Sure, you could save a few dollars a week by eliminating it. And sometimes people will hire less qualified people. and Or they, I hate to say this, hire illegal immigrants, people that do not have um, the proper certifications to be in this country. They pay them off the books. They save money that way, and if there is an accident, there could be a big liability thing, um, especially on the person's property where they don't have the proper insurance. When I had work done on my house this year, I made sure that they showed me an insurance certificate. I was not going to question their citizenship of their staff. The work they did was good. I had a total of 16 people doing work over about two weeks. The job was done properly. There were no incidents. Accidents do happen. Global economy, the economy, technological change. If you're doing like lawn work, they haven't come out with a app on your cell phone that will mow the lawn. You still need people to do it, to prune the bushes, etc. And just talking about the changes in a decade, I know this is going from 2000 to 2010. People are spending a lot more time online. People are not reading. Actually, you can see that there's more books right now. People are reading. Uh, other things are changing. It's a fast changing world. Economies of scale, where if you can make 10,000 or something, it's often cheaper than making 100 of them. They buy in bulk. They're trying to reduce 
prices. Of course, they're going offshore. You can see the production line here to make the candy or serve it where they're automating it. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a factory. I saw where some potato chips were being made. It was an amazing thing to see how they're being made, how they package them, bag them. This was a company in Pennsylvania. Very interesting process. And the chips were delicious. They gave me a sample. And they talk about Fayol. Um, I'd like you to know about these people here. You could read about this in the book. I don't want to babble and make this a 45-minute slideshow. Just saying that there's one boss. And then we have other things here. Whoever wants uh, job descriptions. And we're talking about hierarchy, managing the workers here, chain of command. I think that's important. You want to know who is running things here. One of the work, they have an organization chart. A lot of companies have that. I don't know if Housatonic has one. I will talk a little bit about Housatonic as an operation in a, in a few more moments. But you're showing who reports to whom. Uh, one thing I will say, if you're going into a business standpoint, you would say the Catholic Church has an excellent hierarchy where everything goes down from the Pope all the way down. I would even say to the parishioner, even though they're not employees. But just showing a typical organization chart where you know who is doing what. Bureaucracy. A lot of times that's a negative word, but it really isn't. Bureaucracy is necessary. For example, you have a bureaucracy where you have red, yellow, green lights. If we didn't have that, we'd have a lot more car accidents. However, bureaucracy can be very slow where things have to go through channels. I have seen this in many cases where it could take several months. I've had students who've wanted to take an online class and it could take them like several weeks because they're taking it another college to have it approved. They have summer starting in another two days, and I would say don't wait that long, but you should be able to get an approval for something within a few days. It's also like applying for a mortgage or a loan where I had to wait four months to get approved for the refinancing of a mortgage. Centralization and decentralization, and the decentralization can make things quicker for the most part sometimes it can work when it's centralized depends on what the organization is if it's a bank and people are applying for loans and you have the president of the bank here approving 600 loans a day it ain't ever going to get done span of control how much how many people can you really manage the bottom bullet point talks about having less middle managers but have higher qualified staff where they can make decisions do the work themselves be more autonomous talking about organizational structures where the tall one is where there's a whole bunch of levels of management it could be flat advantages to both this is the flat you got the owner with his six little honchos working for him. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. I would say, if you were on that previous slide, small organization, you don't want too many um, chiefs. You need the Indians, okay? Departmentalization. For example, at the college, we have departments. They're going to have the registrar's office, financial aid. They're going to have the uh, departments where your major is. I'm in the business department. You're going to have maybe the art department, the science department. We have the manufacturing department. And that's where the majors are, where you have one department head where they can help set policy for what the curriculum will be. And, of course, they are reporting 
to a dean. The deans are reporting to the president. But we all have to remember we're all working for the same employer. And then, of course, the um, you have this college. There's many other community colleges in the state. They report to their director. And you know where I'm going. And then they eventually end up probably reporting to the governor. And there are definite advantages to this. Where you have that structure, you know what your job is, you know what needs to be done. And again, disadvantages. Departments have to communicate with each other. I worked for an ad agency with seven departments. And one department would be trying to approach, let's say, Ford. Another one would be approaching Chevy. Another one would be uh, approaching, let's say, Subaru. And you can really only have one client at a company because you're dealing with competitors. So there was sometimes a severe lack of communication where person A would go after another competitor. The other client that we do have gets really annoyed. We end up losing the client. Ways to departmentalize product by function. I would say it who's a tonic. We are organized by department. Ways to do it, another other ways of doing it, geographic, process, whatever. Housatonic only has one location. Some colleges have multiple campuses. Ways to or structure your organization. Different ways of doing it, line, line and staff, matrix, cross-functional. They each have their ideal way, or I would say application here. Line personnel. You can read the slide, pause it if you want. Another flow chart. I've seen a lot of these in my time. They help, and I've seen it where they keep rearranging the boxes every week or two and this is what PowerPoint is really good for making that as a snide aside. Matrix. This kiss can work and it's also a very confusing way. I've never worked in a matrix organization. Um, it can have some advantages but you keep getting moved around a lot. They're putting you into where you are used for that project, but then they move you to another thing here. There's no connectivity or continuity with your coworkers. Not permanent teams. And then you can go into this here too, where the teams are working with suppliers. talks about small, you want small teams you don't want really big ones of let's say 22 people um, you want to match up the skills and make sure it knows what its purpose it's like you're building a house you don't want the electricians running around with the plumbers but you do have to have an organization to say I need to build the house first get it roughed in before I put in the plumbing and the wiring and you don't want the plumber trying to put the bathroom together with the pipes and the sinks when the electrician's trying to put in the light switches. Real-time business, global business network. Real-time means the actual time which something is taking place. Couple of charts showing this in here. And if you're a small business, hiring workers can be is probably your biggest expense. They go offshore. Um, you'll see some coming up here. And you're talking about benchmarking here. 
core competencies. You want to know what you're best at in the benchmarking and your core competencies here. What you can do as well, better than other people in the world. I have succeeded in certain ways in competing against foreign people because sometimes some or organizations because A, they can meet me face to face. B, I have a big understanding or a better understanding of what their needs are. And third, I return the phone calls in a proper fashion. I'm not going to be up at 3 in the morning to answer their phone, but a lot of people do have a normal bedtime. And talk about the healthcare outsourcing. Um, you've got benefits and concerns. Concerns, I could say, drawbacks. You go outside the hospital. You you could you have a thing here with confidentiality. That's a big thing. You get a disgruntled employee, and they could actually steal your identity. I've had this with some credit card companies where I know, in one case, that they actually put three thousand dollars in purchases that I never made because it happened about a week and a half after I called them talks about jobs being outsourced customer sort support you know a lot of times when you call it's offshore manufacturing that is the largest one there you know less and less manufacturing in America and we do have to get rid of certain things. I don't think we see too many manual typewriters anymore. However, the one great thing about them, they work in a power failure. Internet can be helpful, but it does go down. And it talks about Amazon. And I'm sure at least one of my students has used Amazon. And I always love when you buy one thing there. You get emails for the next two years thinking you want to buy that product again. And hello, I bought a pound of some special salt from the Mediterranean, and I only use two teaspoons a year. I don't need an email when I've got a 20-year supply of it. The databases can help, especially if it's something that they might be buying on a repetitive basis, such as you like ice cream and stop and shop will let you know about a new flavor coming out from Briars. And a lot of the students in my classes, you're young people. You've grown up with this whole internet social networking. This is your norm. If you're an adult or someone with more than a couple of years under his belt, um, this is a less significant part of my life. Talks about um, open communication I would say a lot of it is great I love it but when you're seeing students in classes constantly playing with their cell phones and I also see this also with adults too when I'm at a restaurant and I will see four or five adults there all texting or looking at their cell phones instead of having a conversation I've been seeing this for a good 10 years now Restructuring organizations, they need to become more efficient. They restructure, reorganize. Inverted, and this is the traditional one. You got the hot show up here. You got the inverted, the people there, where they're the most important part. Organizational culture with values working with the customers, knowing how it works so that you, way you operate if you're an employee within it. And you've got the formal organization. It can be very bureaucratic, but you do need some bureaucracy in almost any organization, but learning how to smooth it out and knowing how to react. It's not that you should have to notify 18 different people before you call 911. Informal, I like informalness because you could still be a professional here, but when you're informal, the people get along, they tend to have more teamwork, they get more done. It becomes a spontaneous thing where they work together. There are limitations, 
because a lot of times when you're too informal, the staff doesn't want to hunker down when there's an issue or a priority or even a crisis with a client. And so about group norms, okay? And it's like with any company here. Um, respect your co-workers. Be politically correct. I hate to say that, but I'm being honest. That innocuous comment that you could get away with your buddies or your friends will blow over. What I'm doing these little videos here, I am extremely cautious with what I'm saying. I might want to be humorous sometimes, but you have to know when to tighten the lips. Test trip. Yeah, I have these things here. You might want to know these things. Um, and it's not just for the test, but to understand this stuff when you're going into, it's basically for this class, but also in your job. I think all the, my students have a job of some sort, and it will help you to appreciate what is going on with your job.